Hi everyone, so for this week's reading I'm going to be reading to you from this book. It's called The Book of Hopes, Words and Pictures to Comfort, Inspire and Entertain Children. It's been edited by Catherine Rundell who some of you might have looked at some of her books. Um, she's done an amazing book called Rooftoppers which I really recommend you read. Um, I think you might be learning about it in year five. So before I actually get into reading any section of the book I'm going to do the author's note. So sometimes when you have a book like this where it's got lots of different authors contributing to it the editor might write a note. So this is from Catherine Rundell who's an author in her own right but she's put together all of these different stories. A very short note about hope. When the coronavirus pandemic began in the UK in 2020 I found myself urgently in need of hope. Because they are my greatest love, I went looking for it in books. Old books, new books, terrifically serious books with footnotes in Latin, and terrifically unserious books with jokes too rude to repeat here. And I found that, with each book I read, I felt just a little tougher, a little bolder, a little more ready to face the world. And I think this is why... I think stories of transformation, of wild glories and everyday glories, of magic both real and imaginary, can act like a map. They give us a push forward towards hope. Real, true hope isn't the promise that everything will be alright, but it's a belief that the world has so many strangenesses and possibilities that giving up would be a mistake. That we live in a universe shot through with the unexpected, there's never been a single decade in human history when we have not taken ourselves by surprise. We, the ungainly, wonky-toothed human species, have an endless potential for change. I am not an optimist, or a pessimist. I'm a possibility, possibilist. The possibilities out there for discovery, for knowledge, for transforming the world, are literally infinite. There are spectacular ideas that we will have in the next 10 years that we can't even begin to dream of now. So during those th first long months, I began a hope project. I emailed some of the children's writers and artists whose work I love most. I asked them to write something very short, stories or facts or draw something, anything, that would make people read, reading it feel like possibilities, something that would make them laugh or wonder or snort or smile. The response was magnificent, which shouldn't have surprised me, because children's writers illustra and illustrators are professional hunters of hope. We seek it out, catching it in our nets, settling it down between the pages of a book and sending it out into the world. We put it online to read for free at the Nat National Literacy Trust website, and the reception knocked me sideways. Schools made their own books of hope. Children sent me poems and stories and pictures of photographs of hope. It was a sudden and unexpected joy. Amid those hopes, my own is this, that this book, each copy of which raises money for the NHS charities together, will be read long after the coronavirus pandemic has passed. I want it to be a book that you can turn to whenever you find yourself in need of a shot of hope. It is, I think, a testament to what happens when you ask more than 100 people to make something that will kick-start the engine of delight inside the human heart. You could read this collection all in one sitting if you want to, but it's designed so you can dip into it. There are true accounts of cats and hares and plastic-eating caterpillars. There are doodles and flowers, revolting poems and beautiful poems. There are stories of space travel and new shoes and elephants and dragons. None are longer than 500-ish words, so they can be devoured in one bite. One story for breakfast and another at midday, with a poem perhaps for dessert. Catherine Rundell, July 2020. Okay, so we are going to take just one of those bites today, and that is A Song of Gladness by Michael Morpurgo. I've been talking every morning to a blackbird, telling him why we are all so sad at the moment. He sits on his branch and listens. It was Blackbird's idea. He sang out this morning at dawn from his treetop in the garden, 
to Fox half asleep behind the garden shed. She thought it a good idea too. It was a wake-up call. Fox was on her feet at once and trotting through Bluebell Wood, where she barked it to Deer who ran off across the stream. Kingfisher was there, Otter and Dipper too. They heard and piped it on, and Swallow swooped down over the meadow and passed it on to cows waiting to go to the, into their milking, and to sheep resting quietly under the hedge with her lambs in the corner of a dew-damp field. And they all agreed, bleating it out to the bees already busy in, at their flowers, to weaving spiders and grasshoppers and scurrying mice. Trees heard sheep calling too, the whole flock of them, and waved their budding leaves in wild enthusiasm, and high above the clouds wandered through the skies driven by wind, and wind took Blackbird's idea over the cliffs, across heaving seas, where gulls and albatross cried it out, and whales and dolphins and porpoises heard it. They wailed and whooped it down into the deep, where turtles listened, and they too loved the idea. So did plankton, and every fish and crab and sea urchin and whelk, they all whispered that it was a fine notion, the best they ever heard. And the whisper went over the sea on the curling waves to the shore of Africa, where lions roared their approval, and elephants trumpeted it. Leopards yawned it, water buffalo belched it, wild dogs yelped it. Wildebeest murmured it out across the savannah, and Storm lifted the idea up over the rainforest where rain took it and poured it down on gorillas in the mist, on chimpanzees in their sleeping nests. Howler monkeys and gibbons echoed their, echoed their calls loud all over the earth. They are that loud, and then, from far, far up high, sun heard it too and shone it down over the deserts where oxen stamped her foot, impatient to get on with it, and doing it, she loved the idea that much. Even Camel, who had rarely joined in anything, thought it was the best and most beautiful idea he had ever heard. Back in the garden, Blackbird waited till everyone was ready. And then he began to sing. And the whole carnival of animals, every living thing on this good earth, joined in, until the globe echoed with the joy of it. And Blackbird was very pleased. But it was still lost in sadness. As I heard the earth singing around me, it was just, it was a song of forgiveness. I knew that. So, I asked Blackbird if I could join in, and he sang his answer back to me. Why do you think we're doing this, you silly man? We want you and yours to be happy again. Only then will you treat us and the world right again. As you know you should. Only then will all be well. Sing, silly man, sing, sing. Our song is your song, your song is our song. So I sang. We all sang. Sang away our sadness. In every house and flat and cottage, we clapped and sang. In every hut and tent, in every palace and hospital and prison. And they heard, and we heard, our song of gladness, echoing all together in glorious harmony across the universe.